My name is Nicola Lacey. I'm based here in the law department um, at LSE, but I'm a school professor, which means that my brief is to get things, communications going on between departments, and I have a special link with the Gender Institute. So that makes it especially nice to be able to host this joint event between the Gender Institute and the law department uh, with our Leverhulme, or I should say the Gender Institute's Leverhulme visiting professor, Sonia Correa. Um, we're very lucky to have Sonia here talking alongside our colleague from the law department, Emily Jackson, uh, who's professor here. Uh, Emily works on law medical ethics and has done a lot of work on reproductive autonomy. Um, and Sonia, as a research when she's not here visiting us, uh, to our great benefit, she is a research associate for Brazilian Interdisciplinary Association for AIDS, as well as being the co-chair of the Sexuality Policy Watch. And Sonia is going to be talking about uh, the, the um, abortion front lines, Latin American context. Um, and then Emily is going to come in with, Sonia will be talking for about 20 minutes. Um, then I suggest that we then, if there's any very specific question to you on mm -hmm. for clarification, we'll take a few questions. And then Emily will talk for about 15 minutes about uh, DIY abortion. Um, and similarly, we can uh, have some questions to Emily, and then we'll open up for a, a general discussion. We'll have plenty of time uh, for that. So it's very nice to welcome you all, and we very much look forward to hearing what you both have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Should I go? Yes. Yeah. Well, good afternoon. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the Gender Institute for being at LSE. This is a very privileged opportunity for me, and also to the law school for this invitation to talk about the battles, the abortion battles in Latin America. Mm. I should say, perhaps, that tell you a little bit from, from where I speak, huh? what's my location in relation to this topic. Um, I guess I have been, abortion is the topic that I have mostly thought about and researched in, in the last 40 years. And I did so both as a researcher, a theorist, but also as somebody who is really, have been and continue to be really in the front lines of this battle. I do a lot of political action in relation to abortion, particularly in Brazil, but I have also done internationally and in the region in Latin America. Um, one of the last things that I did regionally was a study of the abortion legal reform in Uruguay that took place in 2012. It's a very well-known and discussed reform. And I'm very pleased that the report is just being out today. So it's an incredible coincidence that you're talking about abortion in Latin America and this report is out. It's still not in English, unfortunately. Um, and to talk about abortion anywhere, it, but in, in Latin America in particular, but I guess this applies to any place in the world, um, we need to examine many different sites. We have to look into li legal frames, uh, statecraft, the behavior of state actors, but also the micropolitics of gender, sexuality, reproductive practices, and in particular, I guess, and in Latin America in particular, the role of contemporary feminist movements as the main propellers of the claims for abortion rights. This role has to be recognized, but also critically assessed. I don't have time today to look into all those dimensions. Uh, what I try to do is uh, share with you a bird's eye view, a kind of broad stroke picture. And because we are in the law school, I decided to depart from the legal frames, using them as a sort of scaffold that where I can, we can include the other important aspects. Before moving forward, I want to make a note of caution in regard to the regional frame of analysis. Uh, yes, common threads can be drawn across national boundaries in terms of historical, the history of legal frames, uh, religious politics, feminist trajectories, even in relation to social and demographic indications, indicators. But yet, 
as we know, these commonalities conceal much heterogeneity. Uh, in regard to gender cultures, reproductive practices, sexuality, but also racial and ethnic, ethnic formations that vary, vary a lot across the region. And I would say that also national political cultures, the political cultures of each country have peculiarities that we should not gloss over. So I cannot speak uh, in depth about that, but we have to keep that in mind. Lastly, I will be using many war metaphors. I don't like, it's not my preferred semantics, mm -hmm. but being in the realm of abortion rights research and struggles, I would say it's very hard to evade the semantics when we are talking about that. Um, let's move to the first map. Okay, this is how laws are in Latin America today. Is it clear? Can you read the... So we have four countries where it's totally prohibited. These countries are Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Chile. Chile is now, there's a reform on the way now. The rest of the region is mostly very limited grounds, most, in most times rape and to save women's lives. And we have one case in, in which the law, it's a court decision, Colombia, where women's health is one of, of the premises to allow for abortion, and this enlarges the possibilities. And we have just uh, four cases where abortion is legal, which is uh, Mexico, uh, in, f in fact, three cases, uh, Mexico, Cuba, and Uruguay. Huh? Cuba is from 1961, is the oldest reform. Mexico is 2007, and Uruguay is the last one in 2012. Um, the penal code reforms that have struck down abortion, Chile in 89, El Salvador in 94, Honduras 97, and Nicaragua 2006. I'm bringing these dates here to show you that differently from other places in the world where strict abortion legislation derived from colonial laws, in this case, these are very, very recent reforms. Mm -hmm. huh? They are really reforms of my time. Huh? Very, very recent, and this is very important. And then, in addition to the penal code reforms, we have a number of places in the region where the right to life from conception has been inscribed in constitutions or in very important laws. This you have for the whole world between um, the, the date for Chile is wrong, it's 1980, uh, in fact. Uh, but since Malta in 64 until 2006 in Zambia, you see the number of countries that have adopted that provision and increasingly in the last decade, huh? or in the last two decades. But very clearly, the largest numbers are in Latin America. Hmm? And I think it's important to say that a number of these reforms occurred in moments of democratic transition or democratic intensification, as it was the case of Chile, Paraguay, El Salvador, and Ecuador in 2008. The others, more recent reflect really the reactive responses of conservative sectors to abortion claims that have expanded in the last few years. Hmm? Now, the colonial imprint of Catholicism in Latin America and the pe past and present role of the Catholic Church in the abortion battles of today propels a very distorted view that Latin American laws around abortion derived from religious doctrine. This is wrong. <laughs> Our criminalization of abortion is modern and secular. All these laws derive from 
all of them, just like the British law of 1861 has expanded towards the colony in a different mode because this was post-coloniality in Latin America, all penal codes in the region of the 19th century after independence derived from the Napoleonic Code of 1810. Um, these laws, by and large, these first laws that criminalize abortion, and this is so because, one important aspect, because criminal law during the colony, those was very collated with canonic law, and canonic law punished a lot, a large number of sexual deviations. The list of sexual deviations in canonic law in the Philippine ordinations is huge, but did not consider abortion a homicide. And this is so because those laws follow the Aquinas doctrine of gradual insolment. Uh, fetus were considered like plants. They were not full human beings. They were not ensouled. And this Catholic norm will prevail until the late 19th century. Hmm? And this is why these laws did not criminalize abortion. The early modern criminal laws criminalized the practice of abortion, but not women. What happened, however, is that late in the 19th century and the, in the early 20th century, new laws came that began criminalizing women. What is also interesting is that this addition, this additional prescription, did not come about because of church influence, but rather it came from, it's a result of the influence of criminal anthropology, the criminal science of the late 19th century, particularly Lombroso, that was very racially and gender biased. Uh, in that context, I think it's very interesting to call attention to the fact that two places in Latin America had abortion legalized in the early 20th century. This was the province of Yucatan in Mexico in 1926. In 2009, the various reforms that happened in the states of Mexico to include the right to life from conception have striked down that law that was there for very long. And Uruguay had abortion legal between 34 and 38. Hmm? Um, however, and I will leave that, there's no more, more map now. Uh, from the 30s on, a new cycle of reforms, of penal reforms happen in the context of modernization, industrialization, that have adopted the premise for abortion in the case of rape. It's seven or eight countries. At that moment, the church came to attack those legislations. Something else that the, the, the church did was to try to influence the elaboration of the Inter-American Convention of Human Rights that began to be constructed in 1948. And that process went until 69. And the church or uh, jurists influenced by the church were there making efforts to include the right from conception, and they managed to do so, but in a very peculiar formulation, and we can talk about that later, which allows for a different interpretation than the absolutist interpretation of right to life from conception. A crucial aspect, women had no part in this historical trajectory of lawmaking. No? These laws were made by jurists, by public security officers, by doctors, huh? and sometimes they consulted with the priest. Huh? Uh, and it should be said that early feminist struggles in Latin America did not touch the topic of abortion. Very few voices, but the movement for the vote, the right to vote, for labor rights, for education, sideline entirely this topic, and I think this happened elsewhere. Uh, we had to wait until the 70s for abortion rights claim to flourish uh, in practically all countries. This happened um, as, a, as an effect of the sexual revolutions of the 1960s, but also because of revolutions. This is the case of Nicaragua. Nicaragua was, was going through a revolution and the abortion debate was there very strongly. Huh? Uh, it also was connected with international debates like the UN, the UN Conference of 1975 in Mexico, 
political exiles, women that have left the region and went to France and came to England, that brought back the abortion discussion. And a high point in this regional global articulations was in the mid-90s when the feminists uh, from Latin America and some states pressured by us have played a central role in UN conferences. I'm talking about Cairo and Beijing, pushing for and supporting sexual and reproductive rights. An important political differential of Latin American struggles on abortion, and at least the United States, is that we have never used the semantics of choice. Hmm? Abortion was never framed in terms of an individual choice. It was framed in terms of the right to decide. We can raise questions about rights and decide today, but this was not a minor difference 20 years back. On the other hand, our struggles were at the same time caught by the, rea the conservative reaction that ensued abortion law reform in the US and Europe in the 70s. So as soon as democratic transitions and the abortion debate began in Latin America, we had a reaction there. For example, Chile, and I'm going to talk briefly about Chile and Brazil. In 1980, Pinochet had inscribed, this was dictatorship, the right to life since, since from conception in the Constitution. In 89, he abolished in Chile any possibility of abortion, therapeutic abortion. A year later came democracy. But the Concertación, which is the coalition that run the transition, had made a deal with the Catholic Church and that deal said that the abortion topic was not going to be touched. In the 90s, Brazil reformed this country's constitution. We had a major battle around the right to life since conception. From conception, we won that battle. Huh? We, you saw we are not in that list. And it's interesting to, to see what is happening in these countries today. Uh, Bachelet is trying, have broke the deal finally after 26 years, 25 years. And now she's trying to push for an abortion reform that is fiercely resisted by conservative sectors. If approved, it's going to be very limited. Save mother's life, rape, and fetal abnormality. These are the provisions that are in, we have in Brazil now. One by court decision is not even fetal abnormality. It's just anencephaly. But the Brazilian situation is right the opposite of Chile now because these provisions are at risk of being entirely eliminated in, under the conservative restoration on the way. Not just in these two countries, but everywhere, if it was not for the endurance of feminist movement, this landscape would be much worse. We have faced very solid adversaries. We did not have many allies, and many times we have been abandoned by our friends. Uh, the church has been one key adversary, not just because of its gender and reproductive doctrines that still are very livable, but most principally because of its ongoing influence on politicians across the political spectrum in the region. In the 90s, it was Menem in Argentina, the neoliberal president, and the Central American oligarchs that were the closest Vatican friends when abortion was at stake. But in the last 15 years, we have seen very similar trends at work in the left side of the political spectrum. Um, Brazil signed an agreement with the Holy See under Lula in 2008, not debated by society. Dilma has dispatched the abortion right, rights claims to the drawers. Um, as we have seen, the 2008 leftward-oriented constitutions in Ecuador and Venezuela have inscribed the right to life from conception. President Rafael Correa has been renting female parliamentarians for attempting to push for an abortion reform. And I think that the worst situation is Nicaragua. Because the penal code reform of 2006 that abolished therapeutic abortion, stroke the si crime of sodomy, that's very interesting, it's an interesting pattern, was to that negotiation that Ortega achieved his right to be reelected. 
And since the mid-90s, pro-abortion rights feminists in Nicaragua are considered the enemies of the regime. Two weeks ago, they were in prison for two hours because they were protesting for September 28th. Uh, having said that, I think it's critical. And the church is more or less in all those places. But it's also critical to observe that in various countries, and most particularly my own country, but also in Nicaragua, Colombia, Ecuador, certain areas of Mexico, even Uruguay, evangelical churches and their leaders are now the most vocal propellers of anti-abortion views, in particular in their roles as parliamentarians and elected officials. Rio de Janeiro is on the verge of electing a pastor, its mayor. This may happen in two weeks from now. Because, as in the U.S., evangelic forces are now part of electoral politics. The stridency of the evangelics tends to conceal the continuing and crucial intellectual role of the Catholic Church, especially in regard to lawmaking. Um, and this influence of the church in law making constitutional debates and law and ordinary law itself is usually done in connection with U.S. based uh, works, uh, groups working what, on what they name Catholic constitutionalism. It's a very important stream of thinking there. Uh, the policy agenda of these religious forces is much wider than abortion. They just not attack abortion. They are working on the family, family laws, the model, the model of the sacred family. They are attacking LGBT rights in its various expressions, same-sex marriage, but also sex work, drug use. And now the big battle in Brazil and Colombia, but also Mexico, is the attack on the so-called gender ideology. Mm -hmm. huh? They have crafted this notion of gender ideology, and this battle is everywhere. Uh, even leaving aside abortion and sexuality, I would say that no consistent analysis of Latin America trends today can gloss over the complex and shifting contours of contemporary, the contemporary political economy of religious conservatives. And this could be seen very clearly in what happened next, last week with the results of the Colombian referendum on the peace agreements where the presence of dogmatic religious forces, both Catholic and Evangelic, were a very important, were very important elements, not just the only ones, but very important. Having said that, I think we should not forget that despite the centrality of these religious forces, uh, we should not read that in absolute terms, hmm? because they tend to entirely absorb our attention, because they are so effective, they are everywhere, they are very powerful, strident, and this is so because there are disjunctions between the positions deployed by the religious leaders and hierarchies and what the faithful think and do, their practices. Uh, there are signs suggesting that these discrepancies were more pronounced 20 years back than now. Even the faithful are becoming more reactive to sexual and reproductive autonomy and plasticity. But we don't have enough research about that. This is a big gap. We don't understand so much how, what are the differences between what the church is saying what the pastors are saying and what people at the ground level is doing about their sexual and productive lives. Um, and another important aspect, and I will end here, is that this, their place in this, the central place in this stage should not make us lose sight of continuing secular manifestations of tutelage, disciplining, and coercion in regard to reproduction and sexuality and even gender. Hmm? Even today, in all countries, a large number of relevant secular actors, particularly in the realms of law and biomedicine, but not just there, either entirely avert the theme of abortion 
or remain very reluctant to accept the premise of women's sexual and reproductive autonomy. And the Uruguayan case that we have studied is a particular, it's particularly illuminating about that. And it's something that we can revisit in the debate. Uh, and it should be also said that in recent years, many non-religious sectors have very quickly absorbed without much reflection uh, the arguments against abortion uh, deployed by religious voices, but that are not framed in religious terms, that are now framed in terms of human rights, health, economics, dem demography, and there are a whole range of actors that are buying into that argument. So the situation is, is, is much more complex and we have to understand those complicated fluxes. I will stop here, but I want to list um, four problems, challenges, or paradoxes that need to be uh, discussed more in depth in relation to, I would say this may apply everywhere, but certainly it applies to Latin America. The first is the limits of feminist abortion rights arguments. Um, I'm not going to speak much, but I think that we have expanded from my body is my right towards the team of democracy, of laicite, of gender equality, right to health, uh, a question of social, racial, and ethnic justice. But we have not conceived and called for abortion as a sexual rights issue. And I think this should be discussed. And more problematic, we have refrained from engaging up front with the ethical and juridical and philosophical debates on the meanings of life. And by doing that, we have, we have left the space open to be entirely invaded and monopolized by the religious forces. And I think the situation is not sustainable. We have to address that. Uh, how much time do I have? You, you had your 20 minutes, but if yeah, you want okay. to finish no, off for a couple quickly. minutes, that's yeah. absolutely fine. Cindy. Okay. Um, the second is that I think that abortion rights is caught in the traps of criminal law, what I call the criminal law paradox of feminist politics. Calls for abortion decriminalization are made at the same time that demands are also raised for criminal justice responses to gender and based violence to be expanded not to mention feminist calls for criminalization of clients of sex work. Mm -hmm. That paradox is very problematic because at the same time we call for the criminalization of abortion and we are pulling waters into the mills of hypercriminalization, of calling for the punitive power of the state and that's very problematic. States have been playing strange games in regard to abortion and LGBT rights. Across the region, and I can give you various examples, the states are happily committing to LGBT rights in same-sex marriage, anti-discrimination, sometimes gender identity laws, and at the same time they are dispatching abortion to the drawers to respond to the pressures of the conservatives. There's a little bit of pink washing there, but there's more, and I think we should debate that. And lastly, my question is, is legal reform the only way to go forward? And I think this will give the floor f uh, for the debate on medical abortion. Uh, in the 90s, uh, Latin American feminists had a hard debate about uh, providing abortion despite the law. There were some experiences in the region, in Nicaragua, in Colombia, and Venezuela, feminist clinics were providing abortion. And we had this hot debate if this strategy should spend or if it should move towards opening a public debate on abortion and propelling legal reform. Past 25 years we have seen the legal reform has been very hard to achieve. And we are in a battleground. Huh? Uh, 
Today, biomedical technology allows women to access abortion with relative facility across the region. It's not easy everywhere. Brazil is extremely restricted, for example. And there are many feminist in initiatives that are offering women information and means to resolve an unwanted pregnancy with access to misoprostol or misoprostol and mifeprostone. I think we have reached the point in which it's possible to move beyond the 1990 dilemma, huh? which was either or. I think we need to do both strategies. The question, because both the strategies are indispensable, we cannot do just one of them. But the crux of the matter is how to sustain mm -hmm. these strategies, because the infrastructure of, of feminist movements in Latin America at this point is very, very precarious, both in financial but also institutional and political terms. So there's a big challenge. Thank you so much for giving me more time. Thank you so much, Sonia. <laughs> That was absolutely fascinating and I must say a very sobering corrective to any temptation to think that progress on this issue necessarily goes hand in hand with progressive politics more generally. Um, and I must say it's so I can sad just, and melancholy. Yeah, <laughs> um, it is, it's very, very um, depressing. Um, I must just get in a word is that I'm a criminal lawyer is my main field and I very much what you said about the, the tensions between mm -hmm. criminalization as a strategy, you know, demanding that the state, you know, mm -hmm. deploy its criminalizing power for feminist ends, you know, sitting uncomfortably with the decriminalization movement. There's a, a joke among liberal criminal lawyers in this country that we're all for decriminalization except when it comes to sex and corporations. <laughs> and uh, it's you know it's a good yeah. point that we need to be to be very careful about the way our different you know political positions tie up with each other. Um, can we just take a few minutes if there are specific questions to Sonia before we go to Emily? She's raised a huge number of issues. So yes, would you like to introduce yourself very briefly to say where which department you're from? In, um, in my name's Natasha. Um, I'm in my first year of LLB law. Great. Um, um, I was just wondering, so you, you said that um, that religious influence, especially in Latin America, has like the priesthood getting involved in um, politics. So would you say that you need to, if moving forward, um, movements need to focus more on feminism and gender equality or on tackling religious issues or a bit of both? Which one do you think is more important? I think we have addressing abortion, as I said, as gender equality for some time. We have addresses. My body is myself, uh, my body, my rights. We have addressed abortion as a question of democracy, of plurality, of gender equality very strongly, and of social justice also. Because clandestine, the facts of clandestine abortion really are about poor black indigenous women dying. Huh? Because rich women have access. I mean, th across the region, this is the situation. However, I don't think we have done um, as much as we should in terms of understanding the dynamics of religious politics. And here I would like to make a differentiation. I never use religion as such. I'm always qualifying. Huh? I'm talking about conservative religious forces, dogmatic religious forces, because I think one of the problems is exactly because to demonize religion at this stage, uh, it's not the best way forward. Huh? We have to try to distinguish between and within religious forces, those that are moving this systematic uh, war huh? and campaign against gender equality, gender ideology, abortion rights, and religious people huh? that are out there and that may be allies huh? and that may become allies if we have proper conversations with them. One of the problems we had in the region, in my view, certainly in Brazil, but I guess elsewhere, is that instead of prioritizing the conversation about abortion in society in a more horizontal manner, trying to reach out 
to as much sectors as possible, including religious communities. We have made a bet that influencing the law and the state we do, will do that job. Huh? So by influencing the state, the state is so powerful and the, po and the state is going to deploy um, rights and abortion rights, and it did not work. Mm. And at the p this point, for example, in Brazil, we have a state that is entirely controlled by these forces. <laughs> so we have to get back to society right? and to, to get back to the historic, to the horizontal conversations. So I don't think there's either or. That's the challenge we have to do all at the same time. Thank you, Natasha. Yes. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm a Sorry. master's student in the gender. Can institute. we just give you the microphone so we can record okay. your can question? You <laughs> um, I was really interested in what you said at the end about the paradox between fighting for abortion access and also at the same time the state um, criminalizing sex work. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little more about that of kind of how to or what you see as kind of the fight for equality in sex work and how that relates or doesn't relate to abortion access. Now, I, I didn't speak just about sex work, huh? <laughs> the sex work is the liminal situation, like the stream situation where some feminist voices are, as you know, calling for a criminalization of clients mm -hmm. at this point. But that is not the only situation where feminists are calling for criminal law. Huh? It began with domestic violence. This was the first step. I myself was involved with the creation of police stations in Brazil in the 90s. Huh? And I look back and ask myself, why were we so happy about that? Huh? Huh? Was that the best way of moving forward that agenda at that point, or shouldn't we have invested more in cultural transformation huh? than just betting on the police? Huh? But there's sexual violence. Now, in Latin America, there's the whole history of feminicide. In all countries, feminicide laws are being approved that expand punishment, huh? because it's homicide. So it's already in the books. Huh? It's hypercriminalization. And the problem with that is when you do that, that movement, you align yourself with sectors in society that since the 70s have been constantly pushing for more and more, more criminal regulation of society. Huh? There are a whole, a whole library on that subject. Huh? So as welfare states began collapsing, the tend towards regulation of society through criminal law became a sort of a pattern. And feminists somehow are, are contributing to that trend. Mm -hmm. huh? And so my, my own position is that feminists that are often engaged with criminal justice questions should begin dialoguing and engaging with uh, the intellectual streams that have been criticizing criminal law and the constant resource to the punitive power of the state. That conversation is not taking place, as far as I understand, anywhere. I have been circulating in the world, uh, talking to people in India, talking to people in the US, and you find out that those groups are not getting together. Mm. And this is a major, at this point in history, th that conversation has to, to move forward. Mm. Thank you. It, it's clear for you, or you want to, to hear more about sex work? You can no. talk a little bit. Yes. I'm Grady, I'm a second year LLB student, and you sort of mentioned towards the end of your talk um, about feminist movements of sort of mobilizing community-based distribution of possibly most possible mm -hmm. for this down. And I'm wondering if, are those true sort of grassroots community-based programs, or is this the integration of like Women on Web, Women Help Women initiatives? Um, and in that context, where does sort of the medical profession sit? Uh, is it different between countries, or has it been it very is. much the bay line with the state? This, there are huge differences across country. This is one of the big differentials that we should take care. First of all, medical professionals involved in that directly in the promotion of medical abortion. The two only countries where this is happening systematically is Uruguay. Because abortion in Uruguay is medical abortion, 
basically, and it's provided by the state. It's not in the market, okay? And Argentina that began a program of harm reduction. Hmm? Otherwise, in the other countries, doctors are not so much engaged with that. Secondly, the presence of women on waves is not very intense in the region. Huh? They do much media work, but it's women help women that is really uh, trying to work with people at the ground level in the region at this point. Huh? I myself have a little bit of problems of with the way in which women on the waves have been operating internationally. We had many problems with them in Brazil. There's a white savior syndrome there that is problematic. With women, help women is a totally different story. And these are very ground level groups working in Ecuador, Argentina, Socorristas, Chile, um, and Central America. Much more complicated the situation in Central America because of the law. In Brazil, it's hard work because access to misoprostol is a crime that is punished three times more than abortion itself because it's considered smuggling medication, smuggling drugs. So it's federal crime. The situation of Brazil in, re in regard to medical abortion is the worst in the world, I guess. But it's very grassroots grassroots work going on. I have met some of these people in May and it's really wonderful what they are doing. Amazing. Thank you for those questions and for your response. I think at this point so it would be, I, it's a quick one because I'd like, I want to leave enough time to have questions on both papers because there will be oh, synergies. So, no, come on, uh, no, let's do it. Hi, uh, I'm Rosario from the Masters of Laws and I wanted to know your opinion on the Zika virus and reproductive and sexual rights. Do you think is there a, tr like, are, is the mentality changing now that the Zika virus is there towards enhancing, enhancing reproductive rights of women or not, is not taken into account? No. The, the Zika crisis, in the case of Brazil in particular, I think it's different in Colombia and El Salvador. Each context matters a lot. In Brazil, it was very important to reunite as one factor, reuniting the abortion debate that was a little bit silent since the mid-late 2000s, 2010. With Dilma, the abortion debate went to the drawers, and it's a very complicated political situation. So the Zika crisis came about in the same moment as feminists were already on the street to protest, again, a law provision being tabled at Congress that restricted abortion in the case of rape. Okay. So we were already on the street when the Zika crisis emerged. It was very important for reuniting the debate, for expanding the discussion beyond feminist circles involving doctors and et cetera. In the case of Brazil, there's a lawsuit presented to the Supreme Court now. So it has been relevant from that point of view. But the problem of Zika goes far beyond the question of reductive autonomy. And the situation of women with children that ha have been affected by the syndrome is a problem of social rights more broadly. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of access to health, access to physiotherapy, to, I mean, it, their situation is dramatic. Most of them is, are poor women living in the northeast of the country. So I think it's very problematic to reduce the Zika conversation to mm -hmm. just abortion. You lose sight of the social justice, race, racial justice dimensions of the crisis. And though it has been very important to ignite, and particularly because institutions that had been very silent on the subject now came back on board, like the UN system. Huh? Mm -hmm. UN women, UN FPA. In the situation we are living in Brazil, it's very important to have those strong institutions with us huh? when they were not doing anything about abortion, the situation was worse. But I think that the problem of abortion in Brazil is much wider than Zika, and the problem of Zika is much wider than abortion. Huh? 
and you have to <coughs> think in those terms. I, I get a little bit nervous, you know, with the icons. Now you say India, oh, India, rape. Huh? Now you say abortion, Brazil, Zika. Huh? Mm -hmm. Those global iconic uh, mm -hmm. avatars, no? Yes, it has been important. It has given us much energy, but there's more about Zika and more about abortion. Thank you very much. Thanks for the question, Rosario. So if we can move oh, now on want. to Emily Jackson. I'll just give you some water in a minute. So, um, I think what I'm going to say follows on, um, in particular from Grady's question and the very end of uh, your talk, Sonia, for which many thanks. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly, and basically what I'm going to do is advocate a public health uh, approach to abortion um, using do-it-yourself abortion as a kind of way into, into this. Now, do-it-yourself abortion, women uh, self-aborting, used to be synonymous uh, with danger to women's health. They used to be the same thing. For two reasons, that's not necessarily uh, any longer the case. Um, let me sit here. Um, and that's, in a sense, a result of two technologies. One is uh, the use of pills in order to, um, to affect abortion. And in the UK, 55% of all terminations of pregnancy are medical, they're not surgical. So the majority uh, are now done with pills. This can be very, done very safely at home. Two drugs that you take two days apart, um, and it, there's no need to be in a healthcare setting in order to take them. Um, the other technology that I think is really important here is the internet um, because as a result of the internet women can find access to information about how to do abortion safely themselves and they can also buy pills um, from online pharmacies. It's actually incredibly easy to buy, uh, buy these pills without a prescription. Not all of them will be real, some of them will be fake, but um, it's, it's possible to get these uh, access to uh, abortion pills straightforwardly. So what that raises is the idea that self-abortion, DIY abortion, can become quite safe. It doesn't en anymore need to be synonymous with danger to women's health. Now, of course, in a country um, like England, where uh, abortion is legal and free of charge, very few women will be tempted to do this. DIY abortion would hold very little appeal in a country like uh, the one we're in at the moment, but not none. So it's not, uh, so this does happen um, in England, despite the fact that abortion is available uh, in the early stages, free of charge and straightforwardly. So the women who will be tempted to engage in um, self-abortion in a country like England will tend to be very young women, um, perhaps very distressed women, and uh, importantly also women who are beyond the legal time limit. And this is a criminal offence in this country and the penalties are really very draconian. So. Um, initially, Sarah Catt, who was uh, found guilty of, of, of this offence, was sentenced to eight years in prison, um, which is an extremely long time. The, the sentencing remarks um, of, the, uh, of the High Court judge initially um, suggested that a, a strong deterrence was necessary here, um, which I think is perhaps arguable, because I'm not sure that many women would want to do what Sarah Catt did to herself. Um, on appeal, the sentence was reduced to three and a half years, but nonetheless, women go to prison for doing this in this country. It's slightly more common um, in Northern Ireland because, of course, women in Northern Ireland mm -hmm. can't get access uh, to NHS abortions unless, basically, their life is, is in danger. And so for Northern Irish women, particularly those who can't afford to travel to um, England for, an, for a private abortion, Northern Irish women are not entitled to NHS abortions in England. For women who can't afford to travel, this is um, something that is more common. Women have gone to prison again for this. In fact, a mother has gone to prison for helping her daughter. And um, a couple of years ago, 100 women, more than 100 women in Northern Ireland signed an open letter to the press saying that they'd done this, um, say, we have broken the law, we have um, aborted our own pregnancies. But of course, the idea of safe um, self-abortion is even more significant in those countries where unsafe abortions are a serious public health problem, as we've heard from um, already from Sonia, this is the case in, in Latin America. And of course, the statistics um, in relation to uh, unsafe abortion are 
gruesome that it still happens and it's uh, a huge risk. It's common and deadly. I think one of the statistics that's also really important here is that abortion is more common in countries where it is illegal than it is in countries... Uh, Sorry, in countries where it's illegal than it is in countries where it's legal. So there, abortion happens more frequently where it's illegal, and the numbers are going up. Mm -hmm. Abortion happens less frequently in countries where abortion is, is legal, and the numbers are going down. So there is a divergence. Abortion is becoming uh, less common in, in wealthy countries and more common where abortion is illegal. So the idea of safe, illegal abortion has potentially huge public health implications. And there are, there are two sort of models for this. One self-help model, Sonia's already said something about this, but also there's the, the medicalised model of safe illegal abortion that happened in mm -hmm. Uruguay in between 2004 and 2012 when it was, abortion was um, legalised. And this involved, um, this is a medicalised model in which doctors didn't supply pills to women, they didn't tell women how to obtain them, but they would give advice in a respectful and confidential way on how to, to, um, to do this safely. So it was an advice and support from uh, doctors, and the, the women would also be encouraged to return for a follow-up appointment to check that the termination had taken place safely and to receive um, contraceptive advice. I think this medicalised model had two main advantages. One and the most obvious one is there were no deaths and there were few complications. So this is obviously much, much safer. But another consequence of this, I think, was that women felt as though they had been treated with respect. They felt less marginalised and less alone. That there, was, there, were, there were other benefits to this as well as actually the, the fact that women um, didn't um, we're less likely to die as a result of illegal abortion. And then there's, as Grady mentioned, the Women on Waves, Women on Web approach um, and other um, perhaps different self-help, more, more ground root self-help models. So um, on the Women on Waves website, you can find uh, information about how to achieve uh, an abortion with medicines. There's also advice on, and this obviously um, only, is only helpful in countries where these, these pills are actually available, but advice on how perhaps to get access to them without admitting what you're trying to get access to. So, for example, misoprostol can be used in the treatment of rheumato rheumatoid arthritis. So a woman might be told that you could uh, tell the pharmacist that your granny um, was suffering very badly from arthritis and needed access uh, to misoprostol uh, for her um, arthritis. For countries where uh, women can't get access to these pills, women on web will actually supply uh, medicines to um, following an online consultation where women have to certify that they're less than nine weeks pregnant, that they're healthy and that they're 60 minutes away from um, uh, being able to receive medical care. Okay, so what are the implications of this safer illegal abortion? Well, you could say, uh, particularly perhaps with, with ground root self-help models, that this is empowering uh, for women. There's also a sense in which uh, this could be seen as a quite productive form of civil disobedience. It's almost like sticking two mm. fingers up to uh, harsh abortion laws. They don't have to hurt women. Women can actually find ways to, um, to break the law. Um, but without actually hurting themselves. Um, so there is a sense in which this could be seen as, as, as hugely pro progressive, but of course it isn't necessarily 100% safe uh, because if you do buy medicines from an online pharmacy, they might not be real, they might not be safely stored, they might not be in a safe dose. Um, and of course, for women perhaps who are, say, 16 weeks pregnant rather than eight weeks pregnant, this might not necessarily be safe, so there might be complications. Nonetheless, I think one of the things that's really interesting about, um, about the sort of development of safer illegal abortion is that this is explicitly a public health approach to abortion. Um, and it's, uh, Sonia mentioned this, but you could say this is an analogous to the sort of harm reduction mm. uh, public health approach that we've seen in relation to, in particular, uh, responses to the HIV pandemic mm -hmm. in relation to the use of illegal drug use and sex work. So the core principles of this harm reduction approach are that you're neutral as to the rights and wrongs of whatever illegal activity it is. You're not interested in right and wrong here. You're interested in health and risk to health. 
you're pragmatic and the, you accept that people are going to engage in this activity despite it being illegal. And that's the true with, say, injecting mm-hmm. drug use, it's true of sex work, and it's true of abortion. It's going to happen even if it's illegal. So accepting that it's going to happen, you then concern yourself with the risk of harm and with minimising risk. So you enable people in relation to um, drug use. This might be provision of, of clean needles, it might be safe places for injecting, it might, it might be methadone giving people heroin substitutes. It's finding a way to enable people to be healthy despite um, the activity that they're engaging in also being illegal. In relation to sex workers, it's obviously giving health advice, giving free access to condoms, giving people um, safe spaces. Um, the humanism from, from this, I think, comes from the idea that we're concerned with everybody's health, that everyone's health matters. It doesn't matter if the person is engaging in an illegal activity, their health um, deserves to be treated with respect. So just to sum up um, why I think a public health approach is important here and uh, is perhaps quite productive in relation to abortion, I just want to mention two reasons very briefly. Um, And that's the first is that one of the problems with abortion debates is the extent to which pro-choice and pro-life lobbies are essentially talking past each other that they're not talking in the same terms, they're not talking the same language. So if you come from the point of view where you think abortion is necessary for women's reproductive freedom, pictures of fetuses um, aren't going to make a difference to you because what the fetus looks like doesn't matter. It's irrelevant to the question of whether or not women need access to abortion for their reproductive, um, in order to protect their reproductive autonomy. On the other hand, if you believe that a fetus is a person and so abortion is equivalent to murdering a toddler, questions of choice are also irrelevant to you. Choice is irrelevant if you're talking about killing children. So there's a sense in which these arguments are just completely bypassing each other. They're not talking the same language. So it's quite unproductive. The pro-choice people are never going to uh, persuade the pro-life lobbies and and vice versa. The second reason why I think... uh, uh, a public health approach could be productive is precisely what I mentioned earlier, that abortion's illegality doesn't protect fetuses because fetuses die in illegal abortions. And in fact, they die more frequently in illegal abortions in countries where abortion is illegal than in countries where it's legal, where abortion happens happens less frequently. So abortion's illegality doesn't protect fetuses, it just ensures that some women will die as well. And I think maybe then there could be some sort of agreement that on balance, if abortion is going to happen, it's better to ensure that women don't die wholly avoidable and easily preventable deaths. So safe illegal abortion, I think, is undoubtedly a step in the right direction here, but the most effective, it's the second best, because the most effective harm reduction strategy is liberal abortion law. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Okay, so questions for Emily. I'm going to move around for the final time now that we're through the PowerPoints so that I can actually between you both. Sure. Um, who would like to, any questions for Emily? Can I ask something? Oh, oh no, no, come on, baby. <laughs> yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, um, that for these pills, I think you said up to, thank you, up to a certain time, uh, like nine weeks or so, uh, for that website at least, but I'm wondering if there's potential for maybe not a DIY, but some sort of public health approach when it gets longer, like up to 20 weeks um, in countries where it's not legal or where access is limited. I think, yes, I mean, I th- uh, the, the time period within which you can do um, medical abortion has extended. So initially it was, um, it was thought to be only really in the first seven weeks. I think now in this country it's at least up till ten. So the hope is that the use of pills become safer. But for abortions that have to be surgical, obviously this is really problematic because there isn't really any other option than a doctor doing surgery. So I think one of the difficulties to this idea that safe illegal abortion is is the solution here is precisely for for women who are um, who don't perhaps realize they're pregnant until later in their pregnancy and obviously that's more common 
um, in very young women. Um, it's also very common in older women who maybe don't realise that they, uh, that they actually could still become pregnant. So for women who don't realise they're pregnant until they're later in pregnancy, this is not a panacea. And then you do need a legal solution because you need a registered medical practitioner to be carrying out the surgery. So until you have the technologies that enable abortion to be safely uh, carried out at home at, say, 18 weeks, you don't really have a solution here. I mean, ironically, medical abortion also takes place at the very end of pregnancy as well. So women in this country who find out that, say, their fetus has a condition like anencephaly where it doesn't have half of its skull and its brain, they will have induced labour in order to deliver um, the, the, the dead baby. Um, and that's done with pills as well. So ironically, the pills are at the very beginning and at the very end. Thank you. Did I say yes? Thank you. So in this country, we have this new campaign, We Trust Women, to decriminalize abortion. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you think that the public health argument, maybe, and I know it's a very new campaign, but do you think that the public health argument is something that would benefit that campaign, or it's something they're already making clear, or needs to be sort of developed? Yes. So I think um, I, th I think the I think the health-based arguments um, are are. Um, are good ones to use, and I think I think are being used. Um, I think that I mean I'm I'm I think it's a really interesting campaign, and I'm I'm in favour of it broadly. But I think there are well I'm in favour of full stop. There are some interesting risks though, and one of the interesting risks, and this is a paradox that I think we've grappled with in um, in this country for many years over abortion, is that in practice, abortion in um, England, Scotland, and Wales is freely available. Um, until a relatively late mm. point in pregnancy. Um, and uh, in countries within um, and our close neighbours in Europe where abortion is available as of right, which would seem to be more progressive, there tends to be a lower time limit. So one of the paradoxes is if you were to move towards um, changing our system, having a new law, would you end actually, particularly with the composition of the current parliament, would you end up with a time limit that actually is going to be not progressive and, and make things difficult for, for women, as the, as the woman behind you mentioned, uh, perhaps uh, 16, 18 weeks? So I think, I think um, one of the really sad things is that when abortion law was, was debated in 2008, when there was a progressive majority in both houses of parliament, the opportunity wasn't taken mm -hmm. to change abortion law. Because I think if you were to put um, liberalisation of abortion law before the current House of Commons, you're not going to get a progressive solution. And I think that's like slightly a worry that you open this up and you end up with something that on the face of it might contain a right and might take away some of the criminal pro um, provisions, but might actually have a time limit, which is, say, 14 weeks or 12 weeks, which would not be progressive. I have Thank a you. question for you. Mm. Um, um, do you have information about the percentage of late-term abortions in the UK? Very of, low. Yeah, because this is a very important topic, I guess, for the discussion on right to life and everything, because anti-abortion forces have been using late abortion cases, countries that allow abortion after, as the most problematic cases of abortion and the images and et cetera. Mm -hmm. And my sense is that there's not enough information circulating worldwide about mm -hmm. of how low this percentage is. Yes, mm -hmm. no, it's very low. So um, certainly fewer than 1% post 24 weeks, yeah. quite a lot lower than 1%. But m the vast majority are mm -hmm. under 10. So one of the interesting things about the focus on time limits is the number of abortions you would prevent by bringing down the time limit is very, very, very small. Mm -hmm. So numerically, it's insignificant, but for those small number of women, it matters. This is an interesting. If you have legal abortion, the number of late-term abortions decrease. Is the first thing that from mm -hmm. data that I have seen that decreases more quickly, even that than the, the total number of abortions. Well, if you have illegal abortion, because women have difficulty in accessing the services, the possibility that they are going to have later abortions is much more mm -hmm. frequent. I wonder if I could throw in a point, mm -hmm. um, which in a way connects mm -hmm. your two papers, and it has to do with the political process. Um, I mean, you, you, you'd like to think 
that a, a, a well-functioning political process is precisely in a, in a democratic country is precisely set up to make these sorts of balancing decisions between you know values and mm -hmm. and pragmatism and c things like public health um, but it seems as though here as well as in the, the Latin American context with its m more distinctive rise of evangelism and that the way that has fed into uh, the debates about abortion um, certainly in America as well has sort of taken away the space for that sort of rational balancing mm -hmm. you know so to some extent compromise but you know with with social welfare mm -hmm. more generally as the is that with that is that a sort of do you see any way beyond that is that something that does that ring a bell it rings a big bell I mm. think. Oh, oh, oh. oh the question of of using rational uh, it depends highly on the context yeah huh? and in our experience well politics is messy it's basically messy and it's basically uh, turning around arguments and effects or feelings that are far away from being rational, in general, but particularly in regard to this topic. Coming from Brazil today, I would say if you have watched what happened with the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff, yeah. I mean, that was the last rational political process mm. that we have witnessed in the history of the country lately. Huh? Because it was totally mobilized by passions. And legally, although it followed the rules, it, it's totally absurd that we impeach a president because an, an administrative act. Because this is what happens. So there's no rationality nor reasonable mm -hmm. thinking there. And in regard to abortion, uh, when Emily was speaking, I remember that around 2012, the Brazilian government, Ministry of Health, tried to bring the harm reduction Uruguayan experience to Brazil. It was immediately lambasted by the conservative parliamentarians. The proposal did not survive two months. Back to the drawers. Huh? So no rationality at all. And there was no public health argument that would sustain that. And in fact, at this point, our very good harm reduction programs for drug users are being demolished. So uh, I would say that yes, mm -hmm. but my but own view is that political process is more and more messy mm -hmm. and less rational. And this is one element that we need to take into account mm -hmm. when particularly discussing those topics that provoke so much emotion, emotional political energy. I think that's right. And I think one of the things that's interesting here is that um, there isn't a, I mean, I think it's quite a clear majority of public opinion that is, is fairly liberal in relation mm. to abortion. But, but certainly um, there have been MPs who've been targeted by um, anti-abortion campaigners and have lost their seat as a result of some, some targeting of them. So there, it, it, mm. it is messy, and, and even in a country where you think it's fairly liberal and there isn't these, these religious lobbies don't mm. have necessarily as much power as they do in other countries, uh, they still do have quite mm. considerable clout. Mm. And one of the things that's happened in this country, I think, is a chipping away. It's, 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 it's really interesting. It's sort of chipping away, in particular, at doctors' confidence in applying the um, Abortion Act, which gives doctors a huge amount of discretion in this country. Um, and it's an incredibly effective way of restricting access by making doctors nervous about interpreting that mm. act in a fairly liberal way. And so there was um, a, a sting organised by the Daily Telegraph where they got people to go into doctors' surgeries and say that they wanted um, abortion on the grounds of gender. And, um, and then um, the then health secretary shut down the whole of the Care Quality Commission's um, inspection program, cost a vast amount of money to send all these people into abortion clinics to find out what was going on. Of course, the result was nothing was going on. There isn't 
sex selective abortion doesn't really happen in this mm -hmm. country. Um, but so there was, and then there was a big Department of Health investigation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But there was, it was, it was making people nervous about about prov providing it, and doctors were struck off the medical register because mm -hmm. of this. So it's a sort of making chipping away is um, it's, it's actually really successful here. Mm -hmm. There's lots of moral panic. Mm -hmm. Abortion is one of the topics in contemporary politics that triggers m more moral panic, and it. And the politics of abortion, I think it's point of view of anti-abortion forces is mainly framed in terms of provoking moral panic. And this is, and, and, and people buy it. That's the, it's not just those actors, it's why people buy those moral panics is what we should be concerned with and understand mm. better, I guess. Mm. I think we could probably fit in one more. I, I wondered if you were, would you like, uh, uh, shall we take the two together? Would yes, that be all right? Like, and uh, introduce yourselves. For me, it, it was not a question, more or less, it's more like a um, consideration. I was really interested about the do it yourself abortion because it, this approach could be useful not only where in countries where it is illegal, but also in countries where it is legal, but there are actual uh, obstacles to get an abortion like um, namely well I come from Italy so in my country there are like 80 percent of, of uh, doctors are conscious objector and so it's getting very difficult to get an abortion even though it's considered a right it's free and it's available in every public hospital but also in the US I'm thinking about the target through regulation of abortion providers where like you probably have to drive for 400 miles to get uh, an abortion provider in certain states so would it be useful to uh, advocate for such an approach even in other like in countries where it is legal and probably would it be can it be such an approach useful to uh, take out the abortion issue from the political arena, like to make, to empower women, notwithstanding the, notwithstanding the political, um, I don't know, yes, environment arena. Thank you, and let's yeah. take your um, final question. Um, I'm, uh, I'm PhD from SOAS, Center of Gender Studies, and I'm, and I'm doing a reproductive politics in China. So I think the context is quite different yeah. from what you uh, speak today. And so I have a question, so to, because in China when I, I see a lot of advertisements about abortion in China, even in different hospitals, often public space. So to what extent that you, ca you think that um, the liberalization of abortion can be. Because um, to me, I think this kind of advertisements even like, um, even promote the, the abortion. Like uh, th also, they also have like sales promotion. So, and also uh, another question is since the context is quite different in different countries, so is it, um, how, to what extent and how do you think that transnational movements would become possible across the globe? Yeah, thank you. Do you maybe tell me you'd like to take that one and Emily the, the first question? Yeah. Um, well, Chinese context is very different. <laughs> I was talking about Latin America specifically. In other conversations, I would if I had more time, I would put Latin America in the wider context of abortion laws. And we have those countries where abortion has been legalized because of population control. And China is the best example. Huh? It's not abortion conceived as women's rights, but for to fulfill its state interests in reduction of fertility. And these cases are China, Japan, India, Vietnam, um, basically today. Um, and China has the other problem, which is the problem of coerced abortions, which I understand is being, this is diminishing, but it's also a problem of woman's decision, huh? when the woman is forced to abort. Huh? So the context is very, very different. And, uh, 
But you should look into that also in terms of the politics of abortion and the ability of women to decide. As for uh, the possibility of interconnections internationally about abortion rights, it has been possible because the large majority of countries in the world still have illegal abortion laws in place. Huh? or limits of access, even when it's legal. So there's a conversation there, which should not, however, um, make us lose sight of those cases that are entirely different. For example, the case of China, huh? or the case of India, and you have also the same problem as India, which is selective abortion, huh? sex-selective abortion, which creates new and different circumstances of discussing the problem. Uh, so we need to, to bring into that picture. It's not a problem that we live in Latin America, but when discussing abortion internationally, we cannot do as if coerced abortion or sex-selective abortion is not a problem. Thank you, Sonia. So very briefly in relation to, I think you're absolutely right, this, this isn't just uh, um, relevant in countries where it's illegal. It, it of course, is relevant in countries uh, where abortion is legal but inaccessible. Of course, the issue for many women, if they are in a country where you actually commit a criminal offence if you self-abort, which is certainly the case in England, then that's potentially incredibly dangerous as you know, eight years in prison is, is, is a really long time for being at risk of doing this. And in a sense, what you need in that scenario is accessible access to drugs because there are, we have in the UK artificial laws which mean that you have to have pregnancy terminated in an approved place. It shouldn't have to be like that. These drugs are safe to be prescribed in GP surgeries, in family planning clinics. And in a sense, w the solution perhaps is to make um, early medical abortion incredibly straightforwardly available. Um, and perhaps just as a side issue to that, one of the interesting things which is problematic in this country because it's caught by our, our draconian um, abortion laws, on the, which are on the face of them draconian, um, is the development of new contraceptive, uh, not really contraceptive technologies, contragestive technologies which stop um, which can, uh, are apparently being developed, which are potentially incredibly progressive in the sense that they're a pill that you might take once a month or a pill that you take when your period is, is, doesn't appear. And that is, in a sense, an early medical abortion, but you're, you're not actually diagnosed as pregnant, so you're not sure whether you're terminating your pregnancy. You can't do that in this country because that would be caught by our, our, our abortion laws. But if you were able to have access a bit like the morning after pill, to those sorts of contraceptive techniques which can stop um, a pregnancy continuing, then that's potentially incredibly helpful for women who live in countries where um, abortion is inaccessible. Well, this is such a, an important and such a troubling subject, and I think we're all really grateful to the two of you for having given us so much to think about and such uh, a new perspective for many of us didn't know I certainly was shamefully ignorant about some of the more recent developments in, in Latin America. So, and and it's good to have the sense of some a direction that we at least would like to go in. So, thank you both very very much, and thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just know a tiny story about uh, medical abortion that nobody knows. Uh, the use of misoprostol for abortion has been an incredible invention of Brazilian women and Brazilian drug sellers, the pharmacists. In the 80s, women were searching for a means of abortion in the pharmacies, and these guys discovered that maybe if they tested trimisoprostol, which was for gastric mm. um, problems, and it did work. So Brazil, it was Brazilian women together with pharmacists that have discovered that misoprostol was so effective for resolving the, the problem of unwanted pregnancy in early stages. And it was after that that it began being researched. And I wanted to end with that, because this tells you that even the most dire circumstances of repression and control and everything, uh, women have the ability to think about solutions, and I mm. think we should value that mm. all the time. That's a wonderful note to end yeah. on, Sonia. Thank you Thank very you. much. Great.